Hello friends, my name is Miss Jessie and I'm a librarian at the Central Library of the Buffalo Neary County Public Library. And today I'm going to be reading to you The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. I chose this story to go along with our summer reading theme, Imagine Your Story. I hope you can help me imagine The Little Mermaid as if it took place in my backyard. Have a great day. Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Far out in the sea, the water is as blue as the petals of the loveliest of cornflowers and as clear as the clearest glass, but it is very deep, deeper than any anchor cable can reach. Down there live the sea people. The sea king was so fond of his daughters. There were six of them, beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as bright and pure as a rose leaf. Her eyes were as blue as the deepest lake, but like all the rest, she had no feet. Her body ended in a fish's tail. When you're fifteen years old, said the king, you shall have leave to come up out of the sea and sit on the rocks in the moonlight and see the big ships that come sailing by and the forest and the houses you shall see. None of them was so full of longing as the youngest, the very one who had the longest time to wait and was so quiet and thoughtful. And now the eldest princess was fifteen years old and could rise up above the surface of the sea. When she came back, she had a hundred things to tell. But the most beautiful thing, she said, was to lie on a sandbank in the moonlight in the calm sea. Oh, how the youngest sister did listen. The year after, the second sister had leave to rise up through the water and swim where she liked. She ducked up just as the sun was going down. The next year, the third sister went up, the boldest of them all, and so she swam up a broad river that ran into the sea. The fourth sister was not so daring. She stayed out in the lonely sea and told them that was the most beautiful of all. Now came the turn of the fifth sister. Her birthday was in winter, and so she saw what the others had not seen on their first visit. The sea was filled with large icebergs, far bigger than the church towers that men built. The first time any of the sisters came to the top of the water, each one of them was always entranced by all the new pretty sights she saw. But they longed to be at home again. At last, the youngest princess was 15 years old. Goodbye, she said, and rose bright and light as a bubble up through the water. The sun had just gone down when she lifted her head above the sea, but all the clouds were still glowing like gold and roses. There lay a great ship with three masts. There was music and singing. The little mermaid swam straight up to a cabin window. She could see through at the numbers of gaily dressed people, but the handsomest of them all was the young prince with the big black eyes, and this was his birthday. And that was why there were all these fine doings. Oh, how handsome the young prince was. He shook hands with the crew and smiled and laughed while the music rang out into the beautiful night. It grew late, but the little mermaid could not take her eyes off the ship and the beautiful prince. Meanwhile, she sat on the water so she could see into the cabin. But the ship now took a swifter pace. One sail after another was spread. The waves rose higher. Great clouds came up in the distance. There was lightning. Oh, there would be a terrible storm. The great ship plowed with the speed of a bird over the wild sea. The water piled itself into huge black mountains. The ship creaked and cracked. The stout planks bent with the mighty blows that the sea dealt. The mast snapped in the midst. Now the little mermaid saw they were in peril. She herself had to beware of the beams and broken pieces of the ship that were driven about the sea. Everyone was leaping off as best he could. The young prince above all she looked for, and she saw him when the ship parted and sank down into the deep. For a moment she was full of joy that now he was coming to her, but then she remembered that men could not live in the water. No, die he must not. She came at last to the young prince, who could hardly keep himself afloat any longer in the stormy sea. She held his head above the water and let the waves drive her with him whither they would. At dawn the tempest was over. The ship there was not a bit of to be seen. The sun rose red and bright out of the sky, and it seemed as if life came into the prince's cheeks, but his eyes were still closed. The mermaid kissed his fair, high forehead and stroked back his wet hair. And now she saw in front of her the dry land. Down by the shore were lovely green woods, and in front of them lay a church. At this spot the sea made a little bay. Hither she swam with the fair prince and laid him on the sand but took care that his head should rest uppermost in the warm sunshine. Now the bells rang out from the great white building, and a number of young maidens came through the gardens. 
The Little Mermaid swam further out behind some high boulders which stuck up out of the water so no one could see her little face, and there she watched to see who would come to the poor prince. It was not long before a young girl came that way and came to seem to be quite terrified, but only for a moment. Then she fetched more people, and the mermaid saw the prince revive and smile on all those about him. She felt very sad when he was carried into the great building. She dived sorrowfully down into the water and betook herself home to her father's palace. She had always been quiet and thoughtful, but now she became much more so. The sisters asked her about what she had seen the first time she went up, but she did not tell them anything about it. At last she could no longer contain herself, but told one of her sisters, and at once all the others got to know, but nobody else except them and just one or two other mermaids, who didn't tell anyone but their dearest friends. One of these could tell who the prince was. She too had seen the fate on the ship, and knew where he had come from and where his kingdom lay. "'Come, little sister,' said the other princesses, and with their arms about each other's shoulders they rose in a long line out of the sea in front of the spot where they knew the prince's palace was. Now she knew where he lived, and thither she came on many an evening and night upon the water. She became fonder and fonder of human people, and more and more did she long to be able to go up amongst them. Their world, she thought, was far larger than hers. The little mermaid decided to go to the old sea witch for help. The little mermaid was in terrible fear as she stopped outside the wood. Her heart beat with terror, and she almost turned back. But then she thought of the prince and took courage. "'I know well enough what you want,' said the sea witch, "'and a silly thing, too, all the same. "'You shall have your way. "'You want to be rid of your fishtail "'and have two props to walk on like humans "'so that the prince may fall in love with you.' "'The witch laughed out loud. "'I shall make you a drink, "'and your tail will part and open into pretty legs. "'But it'll hurt.' It'll be like a sharp sword going through you. Everybody that sees you will say you're the prettiest human child they ever saw. You'll keep your swimming gait, and no dancer will be able to float along like you. But every step you take will be as if you were treading on a sharp knife. Yes, said the little mermaid with a faltering voice, and she thought of the prince. But remember, said the witch, once you've taken a human shape, you can never become a mermaid again. And if you don't win the love of the prince, then you won't get to remain human. It is my wish, said the little mermaid. But I must be paid too, said the witch. You have the loveliest voice of anyone down here at the bottom of the sea. I must have the best thing you possess as the price for my precious drink. But if you take away my voice, said the little mermaid, what have I left? Your beauty, said the witch, and your floating gait, and your speaking eyes. With them you can easily delude a human heart. What, have you lost your courage? Give me your tongue. The sun was not yet up when the little mermaid saw the prince's palace. The little mermaid swallowed the sharp burning drink, and it was as though a two-edged sword was piercing her delicate body. She swooned with the pain and lay as one dead, but right in front of her stood the beautiful young prince. The prince asked who she was and how she'd come there, and she gazed at him sweetly and yet sadly with her dark blue eyes, for she could no longer speak. At the palace, beautiful servants clad in silks and gold came forward and sang to the prince. One sang more sweetly than all the rest, and the little mermaid was sad, for she knew that she herself had sung far more sweetly. Then the girls danced graceful, floating dances to the noblest of music, and now the little mermaid raised her pretty white arms and rose on tiptoe and floated over the floor, and danced as none had ever danced. At every movement her beauty grew more to the sight, and her eyes spoke more deeply to the heart than the song of the servants. Everyone was enraptured by it, and none more than the prince. Yes, you are dearest of all to me, said the prince, for you have the best heart of them all. You are the dearest to me, and you are like a young maiden whom I once saw, and certainly shall never meet again. I was on a ship that was wrecked, and she saved me. She was the only one I could love in all the world, but you are like her. But now the prince was to be married, people said, and to take the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king. And it was for that that he was fitting out such a splendid ship. I must travel, he said to her. I must see the pretty princess. My father and mother require that, but they will not force me to bring her home as my bride. I cannot love her. If I ever choose a bride, it would be you first, my foundling with the sparkling eyes. 
The next morning, the ship sailed into the harbor of the neighboring king's fine city. All the church bells rang out, and from the tall towers there came blaring of trumpets, while the soldiers paraded with waving flags and glittering bayonets. The little mermaid waited, eager to see her beauty, and she had to confess that a more graceful form she had never seen. "'It is you,' said the prince. "'You who saved me when I lay like a corpse on the shore, when he saw the young princess, and he clasped his brushing blade in his arms. "'Oh, I am more than happy,' he said to the little mermaid. "'My dearest wish, the thing I never hoped for, has been granted. "'You can rejoice in my happiness, for you are fonder of me than the rest.' And the little mermaid kissed his hand and thought she felt her heart breaking. His wedding morning would bring her death and would change her into foam upon the sea. That very evening, the prince married the princess from the neighboring kingdom. The sails bellied on the wind and the ship glided easily with little motion away over the bright sea. The little mermaid whirled about in the dancing, swerving as a swallow swerves when it is chased and everyone was in ecstasies of wonder at her. Never before had she danced so wonderfully. Sharp knives seemed to be cutting her delicate feet, but she hardly felt it. The wounds in her heart were sharper. The prince had married another. She knew that was the last night she would see the prince. But all was joy and merriment about the ship till long past midnight. She laughed and danced with the thought of death in her heart. The prince kissed his beautiful bride and went to sleep. It was still and quiet now on the ship. The little mermaid laid her white arms on the bulwark and gazed eastward for the red of dawn. The first ray of the sun she knew would kill her. Then she saw her sisters rise out of the sea. They, will, they were pale. Their beautiful long hair no longer fluttered in the breeze. It had been cut off. We've given it to the witch to make her help us, that you may not die tonight. She's given us a knife. Here it is. Before the sun rises, you must, must plunge it into the prince's heart, and you will become a mermaid again. The little mermaid drew aside the purple curtain of the tent and saw the beautiful bride sleeping next to the prince. The knife quivered in the mermaid's hand, but then she threw it far out into the waves. She jumped from the ship into the sea and felt that her body was dissolving into foam. Now the sun ascended out of the sea, and his rays fell upon the death-cold foam, and the little mermaid felt no touch of death. She saw the bright sun, and above her floated hundreds of lovely birds. Their voices were as of music, so ethereal that no human ear could hear it. The little mermaid saw that she too had a body like theirs, which was rising further and further out of the foam. To whom am I coming, she said. To the daughters of the air, the others answered. Your good deeds have been rewarded. You, poor little mermaid, have striven for good with all your heart. You have suffered and endured and raised yourself into the world of the spirits of the air. And the little mermaid raised her bright arms towards the sun and for the first time felt the gift of tears. On the ship there was stir and life again. She saw the prince and his fair bride seeking for her. In deep sorrow they gazed down into the bubbling foam as if they knew she had cast herself into the waves. Unseen, she soared upward with the other children of the air.